All right. Hello, Antiochian Village Virtual Camp. We are so excited here in week three. Uh, today, I wanted to be the one to specifically get to introduce Father Anthony Baba, who is our speaker today, because he has a real special place in my heart because he was one of my first AV counselors all the way back in 2000. Um, for Serenade, we actually dressed up and painted our faces orange as Oompa Loompas. And I remember that vividly. It was Father Anthony. Um, here's my other memory of Father Anthony, and that was at Color Wars. I remember him running down in the old dining hall when they made the, the, um, the aisle for all the counselors to run down. They said Camille, because his name back then was Camille. It was Camille the Chameleon Baba. And it was very exciting. And so uh, that's, those, are, those are two of my many distinct memories of Father Anthony. And he's been just a wonderful friend and a brother priest and amazing, uh, amazing uh, priest over the last several years. Um, Father Anthony currently serves at St. Joseph, I believe. Anthony. St. Anthony the Great down in um, Houston, Texas. I know there's like four or five churches down there. There's, you guys have amazing ministry going down there. The other thing, and then I'll let Father Anthony start talking about Father Anthony um, started family camp down in Texas because out there in Dewama, they have Camp St. Raphael. Yeah, boy. And they uh, started their first family camp last year and had their second one this year and it's growing and they're just doing amazing work down there. Um, and so Father Anthony, that's I'm sure there's a lot more I could say, but I want to let you get talking. Well, well thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Father Christopher. I have to tell you, Father Christopher was one of my campers the last session of camp. Uh, it was in 2000, and I was co-counselors with Father Isaac Farha. Um, and I'll prove it to you by showing you this. His halo is, is illuminating the picture. Let me show you. Right here, you can see, I had a lot more hair back then, but um, he is right above Father Isaac's head. That's Father Christopher. <laughs> As you can see, Father, I've lost my halo over the years. No, no, your halo is still there. <laughs> okay. Your halo is definitely still there. Um, but I remember Father Christopher, how old were you then, Father? 2000, I would have been 20 years 12. ago. 12. 12. I remember, like, if you've ever been a counselor, you have like great campers and then good campers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember Chris at the time being a phenomenal camper, uh, so spiritually close to God. And I remember, if, if there's one thing I remember about that session, uh, it was your tears that last night and just him weeping um, about camp and it being over. And it brought me to tears, too, because I saw this young kid who had a heart for God and it was inspiring to me. And it really had a profound effect on my own life. And it actually um, the whole camp experience, as for many other people, has led them to serve the church in so many capacities. And for me, it was as a priest and a um, I'm thankful, thankful to God um, that I had that opportunity and I had a great camper in Father, Father Chris. Um, so thank you for that, Father Christopher. Um, I didn't realize that. Thank you, Abuna. <laughs> well, a lot, but I do remember those last nights and being so sad to, mm -hmm. to leave and having amazing mentors like you and Father Isaac. Well, we had we had great campers like you too. So and it's not <laughs> not a surprise to me that you are where you are. You are definitely worthy of this of this position because you. you, I'm sure, have had a profound effect on so many hundreds, if not thousands, of children. So, God bless you and your ministry. Um, when Father Chris asked me several weeks ago if I would lead a topic, uh, I had just finished talking to the teens in Austin, Texas. Um, Father Raphael Daly asked me to speak to them, and uh, I spoke to, to them on the book of James. And it just so happened that he asked me right after I got off that phone call, and I had these notes written down for that. And I'm like, okay, I'll talk about James. <laughs> so it didn't require a whole lot of effort on my part as far as what am I going to think about or what am I going to talk about. But I, I love the book of James. Um, 
because it's very practical. The letter of St. James, um, it's, I like short, uh, and it's a very short book. It's concise, it's to the point, um, and it's applicable of just about in every aspect of our lives. So I think it's, when you read it, you can read an epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians or to the Galatians or to the Thessalonians. And you kind of have to like put your mind in that time frame. He's speaking to a certain people at a certain time that we're dealing with a certain thing. But that's not the case with this letter of St. James. St. James is a letter that he introduces the very first line. Um, he says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So basically, it's a universal message that, is, that can be read anywhere at any time. And so it doesn't require a person to think, what were those people struggling with at that time? Um, you know, so, so when we pick this book up, we could just pick it up and read it and say, okay, how can I apply it in my daily life? So it's easy to understand. Um, one of the other things I love about the letter of St. James or St. James himself is that he's called the brother of the Lord. Now, how is he the brother of the Lord, right? Protestant would say that the Virgin Mary had other children and therefore that's why he's called the brother. We know, of course, in the Orthodox Church that we don't adhere to that belief. We know that the virgin was a virgin before giving birth, during birth, and after birth. She's ever virgin. So how is it that he has brothers? Well, we know, uh, tradition tells us, uh, that St. Joseph, the betrothed, was a widower, and he had children previously. And those children were older. Um, he had four sons. He had Simon, Judas, Jude, Simon, Joseph, Judas, and James. Four sons. So James was one of those brothers. So the question would be, why isn't J or Joseph or Judas or Simon called the brother? Why is it that only James is referred to as the brother of the Lord? Tradition tells us that when Joseph died, Joseph the betrothed died, he left his inheritance to his four sons, to Simon, to Jude, Judas, James, and Joseph, right? And according to our basic math, each one of these brothers would have received 25% of the inheritance, right? So they all received their 25%. But what James did was that he treated Jesus as his actual brother, and therefore he took his 25% and gave 12.5% to Christ. So he really treated him like his brother. Um, he didn't see any difference in, in Christ. So I, I think that's an interesting fact there, and, and uh, another reason why I love St. James, because he, he didn't... Um, differentiate that between him and Christ. So we'll jump right into it. And I just have a few, uh, six to be exact, uh, points from James. And uh, I like LeBron James, but this isn't for LeBron James. A point from, points from James was the topic. And it's supposed to say not LeBron James, but anyway. Uh, the first point that I wanna share with you all is from uh, chapter, chapter one, verse 2, and the, um, the difference between trials versus temptations. Um, and James tells us that trials are from God and temptations are from the evil one. So here you can think about what are some trials in your own life and what are the purpose of those? What's the purpose of the trials? And, it, and he tells us, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
but let the patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So people will ask why. Why is God allowing this to happen? Well, it, it's a faith producer. Um, we have these temptations or rather trials um, like Job did, maybe not to, his, to the same extent, but we have these trials to produce and to strengthen our faith. Now, temptations, we should be clear, are not from God. We hear James tell us in verse 13 of chapter 1, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, Christ, himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, and he is enticed. So temptations um, are from the evil one. And lots of times we um, want to attribute that to God. And it's not right. We have to understand that temptations are the way, they're like, they're like darts. The devil constantly throwing darts like temptations in our minds and St. Mark, um, I think it's St. Mark the ascetic who says that the temptation comes and then the coupling, whenever you start putting that thought that's in your mind and it descends into your heart. Um, and then the third is the decision to act and the fourth is the act itself. So sin or temptation, if we let it, can escalate very quickly. Um, so we're always going to be tempted. We should be, um, you should know for sure, for certain that temptations are not going to stop coming. As long as we live, the devil will tempt us. And the closer we grow to Christ, the stronger those temptations become. So being mindful of what those temptations are, we can say the prayer of the, the Jesus prayer, um, making the sign of the cross, um, fo refocusing where our minds are going. Lots of tools or things that the church gives us to sanctify ourselves through the sacrament of confession, of course, um, communion, and, um, you know, having a friend who you you can be accountable to, uh, a spiritual father. Um, so know the difference between what trials are and what temptations are. That's the first point. The second point is hearing the word of God versus doing the word of God. And so he says, very, very practical. So then, my beloved brethren, St. James says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, I had a professor in seminary who always told us, as pastors and even as people, just if you're a Christian, just a, you're just a person. Always respond, never react. Always respond, but never react, because reactions are, are impulsive, and they catch us at our worst times. But someone who has a response to something has thoughts. He thinks about those thoughts. He allows those thoughts to penetrate his heart. And if those thoughts are good thoughts, they come from the heart, then we'll know like, okay, this person is actually, you know, he's making sense. He's not just um, being reactionary. Um, and, we, and we know many people. And, and in fact, we become reactionary ourselves when we're not careful. Um, we might say things that we regret or like, man, I wish I would have said this differently or um, so, so we hear in, in, in Vespers every, every time we chant, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and the protecting door about my lips. Like literally put a door over your mouth because uh, what we'll hear is another point that I'm going to make, um, point number five. But if, if we if you were able to control what we say, 
um, you know, then, then we'll be able to better respond to situations. Um, you know, calm breeds calm, panic breeds panic. So if you're calm, good chance, there's a good chance that people will react or respond in a calm way. Um, so, slow to speak, swift to hear. That's point number two. Um, can I ask a question to the people in the group? All right, so what the question I have would be, what does it mean? This is point number three. Um, what does it mean to have religion, to be religious? Actually, according to St. James, what is pure religion? That's the question. What is pure religion? Anyone? I see a Jer I don't see a Jeremiah, but I know he got unmuted. Hi, Jeremiah. Hi. Um, hmm. can't, can't see. Um, I think pure religion is like what you believe. Okay. Pure religion and what is and what you believe is is hopefully and pure and true. And we know that truth is Christ. Okay. George or Natalia want to take a shot at it? What is pure religion? It's like believing in Christ. And like you said, think about what you say before you say it. And like um, having um, that other thing like thoughts before reactions. Good, good. Natalia, is that Natalia from St. Anthony, Natalia? Hi, Father Anthony. Hi, Natalia. What is pure religion, Natalia? Um... To me, it's just like being mindful of your actions and words towards others, even outside of the church. Okay, okay. So, to be to have pure religion, um, from what I'm hearing, is is not what it's not is it's not going to church, it's not um, saying the creed or how many times you say the Our Father. That's kind of what y'all didn't say, right? What does St. James say about what pure religion is? Look at chapter 1, verse 26 and, and 27. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So I think uh, Jeremiah or George, I can't remember, but you said watching what you say, right? If a man does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This person's religion is useless. And then hear what he says about what pure religion is. He says it is to visit orphans, and widows in their trouble. So pure and undefiled religion to visit orphans and widows and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To keep oneself, to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Now we're living in a world where it's so easy to be spotted to sin, because there's lots of things that are going on that are causing us to become, as a society, angry or nervous or um, just uh, anxious. But pure religion is to keep yourself unspotted from the world so that no matter what happens, no matter who takes over, who's the president, um, you all can agree that like what we're watching, if you're watching the news is very sad and tragic. And if we continue to watch that, 
we certainly will be influenced by what we see. I mean, I watch a Marvel movie and I just want to go out and like be violent sometimes or just want to wrestle my son or, you know, uh, there's things that we do after we watch something, we want to do it, we want to imitate it. And it's very dangerous. Um, so, so St. James is saying, okay, he's not saying not to watch, but he's also saying when you watch, or when you are in that, you, he's acknowledging that you're living in the world. He's saying, keep yourself unspotted. Don't let that influence how you live your life. Um, I'm going to continue because I feel like I only have like a few more minutes. But um, having a faith that actually works. So that um, that's what, the, the point number three was, we'll start from the beginning trials versus temptations was the first one hearing the word of god was the second one what it means to have pure religion is the third one and then having a faith that actually works is the fourth point and that's from chapter 2 verse 14 which he says what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works. Can faith save him? Can, a faith, can faith save a person? If he, like if I say I have faith in Jesus Christ, but then I'm walking down the street and then there's a man who's cold and who's hungry and I just walk by him and I say, um, well, I'm going to pray for you. Is, that my, is my faith going to help that person? No, it's not. <laughs> So we as Christians have to do that which we're called to do, which is I need to give them a coat. I need to give them some food. There's lots of food in my refrigerator and I have more than one coat hanging in my closet. And so St. Basil the Great says the coat that's hanging in your closet that you're not using, he calls us thieves. We're stealing from the man who doesn't. All the extra shoes we have in our closet, we're stealing from those who have no shoes. So again, this is a faith that works. We don't just say, oh, I believe in Jesus, and that's enough. Believing means doing. And so we have to ask ourselves, what am I doing that professes my faith? Faith and works, they go hand in hand. They, it's not one without the other. You know, a bird has two wings and it can only fly with two wings. It can't fly with one wing. And that's as Christians, we're the same. We need faith and we need works to fly. All right. I spoke about this a few minutes ago when I said controlling what we say. That's the fifth point. Um, don't speak evil. It's very, very simple. Do not speak evil of another. Don't criticize others. Don't become judges of other people. And then the last point, uh, the sixth and final point, is simply to be honest. And this is a very hard thing to do because sometimes we might not want to make ourselves look bad, so we'll say a white lie, or sometimes we're afraid to tell the truth, so we won't tell the whole truth. Um, we're just afraid perhaps of consequences, but you know that feeling of if and when you lie, you have to remember that lie so that you don't have to, so that when that comes up later on, you have to like remember um, what that lie was so that you're not contradicting what you had previously said. So the lie sort of has that snowball effect. And St. James says, um, be honest with yourselves. And it's the very, it's the very last, um, well, it's not the last, it's the last chapter of James, verse 12. He says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any, or with any other oath. And he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your word be good. Be honest with yourself and with others. It, it, it'll make you sleep better at night knowing I remember, and I'll, and I'll just share this story before um, I'll close. Uh, 
I remember when I was in second grade, I I'd, I'd lied to my mom about a book that I received. She thought it was from the library, um, but I took it from my friend and I told him that I lost it. And so I lived with this lie for like, I remember up even until the sixth grade when I learned, okay, I should probably confess that four years later that I stole a book from my friend and lied to my mom about it. And then that book was in my room and uh, oh, it still pains me even uh, like 30 years, more than 30 years later. <laughs> but I've confessed it. But the point I'm trying to make is when you lie, you have to remember things. But if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. And it's better for you, better for your soul, better for your body too, because when you lie, something happens to your body where you just don't feel right. So sleep well at night by telling the truth. Um, but that's all I have. Uh, thank you, Father Christopher, for inviting me. If there are any questions or comments that uh, anyone has, please feel free. I know we don't have, we only have a few more minutes, so I try to stay within in the time frame. You guys have any questions for Father Anthony? No. How hot is it in Houston in the summer? <laughs> it's actually pretty cool right now. <laughs> considering well, your, that it's July. What's your definition of cool? I mean, like 85 to 90. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeremiah, My definition say. of cool is under 50 degrees. I uh, consider yeah. 85 to 90 cool. I consider like 75 to 90 cool. Perhaps low 80s cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you lived in Houston, you would certainly feel like 85 was awesome <laughs> in July. <laughs> it's usually 100 right now, so we're good. Thank you all for for. For participating and, and Father Christopher again I miss you and I love you so much and and I pray for you and your ministry at the Antiochian village I know you'll do great things you're already doing great things in this in this uh during this time this pandemic so thank God's you great. so much for being with us Father Anthony seriously it is awesome just to see you and to have you um, as you guys know our counselors are kind of like our superheroes um I'm gonna be honest I still look at Father Father Anthony, I almost said Camille, but Father Anthony as um, like a, a superhero to me because he, he was and he still is my counselor here at AV and I, I treasure that relationship and I just encourage all you campers too to um, develop and uh, maintain those relationships because as you can tell I still have I'm still blessed to have a relationship with, uh, with Father Anthony and He's doing awesome things down in Texas and we appreciate everything you're doing. And thank you so much for visiting with us at AV. And um, I know Camp St. Raphael is so blessed to have you as a session priest and we are blessed to get to listen to your words for a few minutes. So thanks thank for sharing. Thank you, Father Christopher. Us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, guys. All right. In name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We thank you, O Christ our God, that you have brought us together for this for this time, please always keep us safe in your holy hands and Father Christopher and, and his ministry and those who minister with him. For in you we put all our hope and trust and to you we send up glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. God bless you. you guys Take too. care, guys. Bye.